a new YouTube channel? What are we, insane? Insane. It yes. feels crazy. It feels crazy to do this, but we're doing it. The channel is called Creator Support. This has been an audio exclusive show that we've been doing for the past year. The goal of Creator Support is truly to make it a community-based show. So we're going to continue to take questions from all of you. Samir and I will talk about some of the different topics that are happening in the world of creators and occasionally we'll bring on experts so we can hear from them. Now on our main channel, we're still going to be bringing you behind the scenes with some of the biggest creators on the platform and really showing you the ins and outs of how the creator economy is building. But we also wanted to have a space where we could speak directly to all of you and do it on a weekly basis. And most importantly, really just react and respond to the problems you guys are facing or the support that you need. Now, if you're listening to the show, then actually nothing has changed for you. But we do want to let you know that we're now uploading video of this show to a brand new YouTube channel. And if you're watching here on YouTube, that's what you're watching. So everything has changed. Everything. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about how much YouTube paid us in 2022. And if you've seen the title of the episode, you already know that. But we're also going to be answering questions from all of you as we do on creator support, we're going to be getting into, you know, why some of these ad rates fluctuate, what the difference is between a CPM and an RPM. And we're going to dive deep into just how to make money from YouTube, the platform. All right. I think that's a long enough intro. Yeah. Yeah. Again, no rules on this channel, Colin. No rules. No rules. So this is creator support. Subscribe if you happen to be watching on YouTube. Continue to listen and give us a rating if you choose to listen. Listen, watch it, do whatever you want. And if you make it to the deep end of this episode, let us know. All right. Let's get into it. So, um, blue jumpsuit. Yeah. It, it feels like it's a uniform for mm -hmm. creator support. And I'm debating wearing it every single time that you and I record an episode. Oh my God. If we have a guest y on the show. committing to like an every, every episode thing. I said debating. Yeah. That's a big commitment. Putting it out in the open is a bit of a commitment. Right. I'm feeling it out. It's an experiment. So if you're listening, then you are, have not seen this blue jumpsuit, but you can pop over to YouTube and, and check this out because this is our first episode on this YouTube channel. And Colin is debuting an outfit that he's potentially going to wear every single time. And this is about being my truest self, right? This is something I wear at home. You do? Yeah, of course. It you have good. a home jumpsuit? This is a home jumpsuit. It's like a robe for some people. You don't wear a robe out in public. That is so strange. This that is you have a, a home, home outfit. outfit. Yeah. Because that's like not a comfort. It's not like you, a pajama. You don't suit. have like a hat that you're not fully confident about wearing out in the wild. So you just wear it at home. No. Come on. I don't. I Come don't. On. You don't have anything. No, I wear like I'm pretty comfortable wearing stuff outside the house and inside the house. Well, look, I like to push the envelope. I'm experimenting at home and maybe. Okay. Please let us know. All I'm saying know. here is that I'm trying to be my truest self on creator support. Let's just please get a, um, let's get some, like a poll going. You know, I'll post a photo in the subreddit. Okay. Yeah. But you can also comment on YouTube. You can also tweet at us. You can, you can let us know, is this jumpsuit here to stay or not? Now we're not here to talk about jumpsuits. True. Well, we kind of are, but really we're here to talk about making money on YouTube. Now this, this genre of video is just such a popular genre of how much money YouTube paid me for X amount of time, right? Or like how much YouTube paid me for a hundred million views? How much YouTube paid me in 2022? And I always find it really interesting, primarily because of how variable it is. Mm -hmm. Like how much it varies, how much money people make on this platform. And some people are making a lot. A lot. Like, and honestly, a, um, a, a unimaginable amount. I remember when Graham Stephan, who's a finance creator, <laughs> made a video yeah. three years ago, potentially, yeah. about this. And he's scrolling through his YouTube backend and every day he's making around $10,000. Yeah, that's crazy. And and he even came on our show and talked about how he made $4 million in a year. It's it's an unimaginable amount of money. And one of the most interesting you know things about the YouTube era of creativity- $10,000 a day? It's crazy. I'm sure he makes more now, but sure. $10,000 a day. And that was across multiple channels. But yeah, the YouTube era of creativity is like, one of the most fascinating things about the concept of making money on YouTube is that you're not picking up the phone and pitching yourself to anyone. So long as you're a good partner to YouTube, you follow the rules and you make content that people want to watch, YouTube will just pay you a check without you really having to talk to anyone, do anything, pitch rates. It just kind of magically happens. I mean, if you're listening and watching this on YouTube, 
we're recording this now, but there will be ads on this video and we don't even know who those at. Yeah. Who those people are, what they're necessarily yeah. selling. Mm -hmm. It just happens. And then we get paid for it. Yeah. Advertising is not an easy business. No, it's not an easy business, but, but YouTube has made it easy on the creators. And I think that's something that's, that's why we all are fascinated when we share these numbers, because the reality is it does vary based on the type of content we make, based on the length of content we make, based on the month, based on how many placements there are. There's so many variables. So we all kind of want to know. And so based on if people like the jumpsuit, if they don't like the jumpsuit, that these has things, no bearing. These things matter has no bearing when on, it comes yeah. to advertising on YouTube. It has no bearing on how much money we make on YouTube. So in this episode, we're here to kind of express and, and tell you guys what our you know, advertising revenue in the past year has looked like, what we have learned over the past four years about how to make money from YouTube and also explain and answer some of the questions that you guys submitted about CPMs, RPMs, the different, you know, uh, terminology that, that relates to advertising. And then also our philosophy when it comes to AdSense and how do we think about it in terms of our business? So I think we should just dive in up top and talk about how much money we made in 2022 on YouTube. So in 2022, we made $268,000 ten dollars and nineteen cents now how many views is that that is on 183 million views across the whole channel um but 123 million of those are from shorts so and 60 something million yes someone can do the math is more accurate in terms yeah, of I mean, how 60, many 60 yeah. million 60 million views on long-form content yeah that to me feels huge in 2019 the first year that we received a check from youtube it was around $4,300 that we made. Yeah. For, so, okay. So I have the graph up right now. Well, also in 2019, we did 3.2 million views on YouTube and we made $4,458. In 2020, we did 5.6 million views and we made $16,523. Then in 2021, we did 107 million views. That was a huge jump. A lot of that was also shorts at the end of the year, but a lot of that year was long form content, $109,000. And then in 2022, a massive jump up uh, to 183 million views and yeah, $268,000. So this has been like a crazy, like this is exponential growth from 2019 to 2022. I mean, 2019 to 2020, almost 4 x right. the growth. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a really interesting, you know, uh, thing that happens with creators that on YouTube, it's not only you know, do you just make videos with larger viewership? But actually what starts to happen is your catalog becomes a lot more valuable, meaning the videos that you've made in the past, people are now discovering and watching. And as your channel kind of lifts, all of that content starts to get more viewership and all of that, so long as it's monetizable, is generating you money. That is the the, the base foundation of, of YouTube. I mean, proof of that is looking at the month of January where we have yet to upload a single video to the main channel. We have yeah. one short yeah. posted to the channel, but we haven't uploaded a single video. And yet we've already done 2,641,123 views. Yeah. And we've received already $8,588.54. Yeah. We have not posted a video. Right. And we'll net out around 10 grand for the month of January. That yeah. is- and we've gained 12,000 subscribers. Yeah, we haven't posted anything. Um, but again, it's this is this is something that I think all creators should recognize. As you're uploading content, it's not about the video you're making. It's about adding to a library. And I think that's also something that you should develop from a relationship to your work of like performance. Like you, you have to look at the videos you're making, both from a creative perspective and from a business perspective, as putting a book on a bookshelf that's going to be read for a very long time. You're adding something to your library that should be, you know, be able to be consumed for a really long time. Something that I didn't think about when we were speaking with Amar from Yes Theory this morning, and we were talking about the difference between maybe publishing on Netflix and publishing on YouTube. Mm. And we were talking about how the shelf life of a piece of content on YouTube might actually be way longer than the shelf life of a piece of content on Netflix. We don't yeah. know for sure. But yeah. But it seems like because of the searchability of a YouTube video that you know your library or a, or a specific video 
posted three years ago can have many lives in terms of viewership, in terms of revenue. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the intricacies here because on, on the screen grab of seeing our revenue, you're also seeing an RPM number and a CPM number that are both drastically different. So I want to talk about this. This question comes from Alex. I'm not even going to try this last name. Seren- Sred no select. Okay, you tried it. That was pretty good. I'm just going to go for it. That was good. You kind of have to go in. New me. You have to go in with confidence. Alex Srenoselak. Yeah. The difference here is that I'm wearing a jumpsuit and you're not. Yeah. Okay. Come on, man. <laughs> that's, All right. That's what it comes so down to. So his question is why CPM and RPM can be so drastically different. Considering it's a 55-45 split, I don't understand why RPM would be below that. Okay. So first and foremost, you know, if you guys are creators, then you know how this works. But, it, you know, just to give you a refresher, we enter into an agreement with YouTube when you join the, the YouTube partner program, where essentially... You say, I will follow, you know, these rules, content guidelines, I'll upload, you know, a certain type of content, and then that will qualify to be monetized. And in that, we're going to split ad revenue. I'm going to get 55% of the revenue. You're going to get 45% of the revenue, YouTube being you. Um, and, you know, your CPM is cost per mil, which essentially means uh, the cost to the advertiser per thousand views. So if like there's a buyer, right? So let's say like Gillette wants to buy And the way they're going to buy is they're going to say, I'll buy a YouTube advertising campaign. I want to speak to 15 to 25-year-old males in the United States. And I'm willing to pay $20 per thousand views, you know, on those. Like, that's the the CPM. Um, Basically, what's going to happen is YouTube's going to serve that to an audience. So when you're, when you have ads on your channel, It's not necessarily advertising specifically on your content. It's advertising to the audience that's watching. So multiple viewers can get different ads on your same video because YouTube is tracking the viewer, not necessarily your content. If your content is serving that viewer and it's serving it to higher price point, you know, companies, companies that are willing to pay a higher price point, companies that are paying higher price points, your CPM is going to start to bump up based on the audience that you're serving. Mm -hmm. So our CPM is $14.68, which is actually relatively high CPM on YouTube. So that's the cost to advertise on our channel per thousand people who watch an advertisement. And that can depend on how targeted the group of people is. Exactly. How competitive the space is. If a lot of people are trying to advertise razors, right? Then the cost will go up. There's so many factors that will drive that price either up or down. If we have a really concentrated group, like if we just had a shaving channel, then it would be higher priced to advertise to our audience. I think we could have a shaving channel. I think we could have a shaving channel. Because I have to shave almost every day. Which is crazy. Yeah. And I haven't shaved this beard off my face since October 2016. You're more so in a maintenance mode. Yes. Yeah. What do you mean maintenance though? You need to keep it trim and yeah. nice. Okay. Ma- you're That's maintenancing you your beard. Okay. How could that be taken any other way? I don't know, man. The way you said it, the jumpsuit brings out like a very aggressive vibe in you that I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now you, you look at like for mass channels, a lot of times when you look at CPMs, they, they lie between like five and $7. That's where the CPM lies. Um, and a lot of that is because it's reaching such a mass audience that it's a little bit harder to target. And a lot of people ask us why like finance channels have such high CPMs. Well, they're so incredibly targeted. Like if someone's talking about finance and and making, you know, uh, giving opinions or making suggestions on financial products, then if you're a credit card company, that's a really great audience for you. And you're, you're, you're trying to find that audience. They're only in a few areas. They're going to be on Graham Steffen's channel and Andre Jick's channel. And, you know, and it's basically targeting those people. Those audiences have shown that they have money that they're willing to spend. Right. And for a credit card company, they don't need tons of people. Like there's more value. They will spend more to acquire potentially less people right. because there's a lot of long-term value in those people. So now you're looking at the RPM or, you know, I'm going to read to you the RPM, which is $5 and 47 cents. That feels like, I mean, it's more than sliced in half from our CPM, right? RPM stands for revenue per mil, which means the revenue per thousand views on your channel. So to be clear, RPM is after the split with YouTube, but it's not exactly 55% of the CPM. Yeah, there's a lot of other factors at play there. So this is a really important thing for creators to understand, the difference between CPM and RPM. The CPM is the cost, how much someone would pay for that. The RPM is the revenue you receive based on variable factors. So if you noticed as a you, as a viewer of YouTube, you don't get served at an ad every single time you watch a video. 
And that's because YouTube is tracking, again, the viewer. They're tracking to see the viewer's experience. If they just watched an ad, like if they just watched an ad on, let's say, like Mr. Beast channel, and then they come over to Colin and Smear, YouTube doesn't really want the experience for you to just constantly be watching ads. So actually, they're going to make sure that you're not being served all the time so that you have a more enjoyable YouTube experience. YouTube, the platform, is always going to aim for viewer satisfaction. And that means they're going to serve ads when they think, you know, it works for a viewer to watch that. That means that every thousand views on our channel, those are not always monetizable views. So there's, you know, someone could be watching through YouTube Premium, which has no ads. Someone can be, uh, have just been in a long session and they're not going to get a served an ad. Somebody could watch multiple mid-roll ads on our channel, so it'd be higher. So the revenue is giving you that realistic depiction of how much money are you actually making per thousand views. What do you think the value is for creators like us in knowing these numbers, RPM and CPM? For me, it's been interesting to see them rise. Yeah. And it feels to me like our channel is now a more trusted partner to yeah. advertisers. And perhaps that's why RPM and CPM is going up. We're also putting out more <clears throat> content, longer content. There's more opportunities for ads. But I'm curious, do you look at our RPM and CPM and make any sort of decision about our business? Does no. it help you understand anything about how we operate? I don't really make a decision based on it. Um, I, I agree with you that I think I just, it, I note it in my head for where we stand on the platform. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that I can control it beyond like the content we're making. And, you know, the fact that we make really long form content on our main channel, you know, long form interviews, I, I noticed that the longer the content got, the higher the CPM got and the more targeted our audience got and probably the more, you know, elevated at, at times that our audience got, um, like we're making really slow content that speaks to a business minded entrepreneurial person and you're noticing that over time, as that became more solidified, our CPM started increasing. And that's all. It's just an interesting thing for me. But I think that also brings up the point of like, how do we look at this $268,000 that we received last year? It's very, this is the first year that it is really substantial. Yeah. Of course, you know, last year or 2021, I'll say $100,000, that's impactful. There's no doubt that that's yeah, a big of number. But we have a lot of expenses, you know, that money goes to use. This year, 260 plus thousand dollars was surprising to me. Yeah, there. what was really interesting was to, you know, recognize that essentially when you look at our, our last year, what happened was in July, actually, we, we saw like a dip because we went on vacation. In July, we went, we went on vacation, but we still collected almost $12,000 without uploading in July. And then when we came back, that's when things really picked up. As the year went on, basically from the summer on, it was always 20,000 plus. And what's interesting is like creators notice that there's months that are, that are higher in CPM, months that are lower. So another question, like why the variance? Based on the ad market, mm -hmm. based on how much people are spending. It's like if advertisers in January typically are planning their year and not spending yet, ad rates are going to be lower. Advertisers at the end of the year spend a lot of money during the holidays. Ad rates are higher. Like we are tracking the ad market. I would imagine it also has to do with supply and demand in your category. Yeah. You know, if you look at when we were making creator economy interviews last year, there weren't as many podcasts right. with creators, long form interviews with creators. Mm -hmm. There are now a lot more. And I would imagine that plays into the competitive landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why don't we talk a little bit about why we think there was such a drastic increase, specifically between 2021 mm -hmm. and 2022. Mm -hmm. That goes from $100,000 yeah. in 2021 to, like we said, 263, was Eight. it? 268. 268. You can't latch onto that number, huh? No. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> no, no, but I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've said like three or four different numbers. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, I can't latch onto the number. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... I mean, the main thing is we saw a dramatic increase in our CPM this year. And, you know, our, our expectation of that is because as we started doing longer form interviews towards the end of the year, we also increased our AVD significantly, meaning the average view yeah. duration. In the beginning of the year, all of our episodes on YouTube were primarily between you and I. And they were like 20 minutes. They were 20 minutes. Uh, yeah. They were a little bit scripted. Mm -hmm. So they moved quicker. Yeah. 
And I believe we did around 16 of those episodes yep. in the front half of the year. Second half of the year, we did 18 or 19 long form interviews in addition yeah, to some studio tours. Which were like hour plus. Like yes. Cody and Noel, for example, when we interviewed them, that was an hour and almost 40 minutes. And our AVD is 45 minutes on that. So that means like, you know, in the beginning of the year, if our AVD was 50% on a 20 minute video, people were watching for 10 minutes. 50% on an hour and a half is a mm -hmm. lot more, right? It's 45 minutes. Like, so our AVD got pushed way higher as we started making longer form content. And that, you know, allows for multiple ad breaks. It allows for like a different type of viewer. Uh, it allows for just, a, you know, totally different um, style of advertising on the channel. And this is actually the first time that our channel has been like that long form. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our highest, our, our video that made us the most money, which is that interview with Mr. Beast, uh, that's over two hours or just about two hours. And that made us $64,000 in the year. So pretty crazy. And if you look at um, this graph that we have um, that shows like the different uploads we did, you also kind of see there's this clear moment where our CPM increases, which is around where we start regularly doing long form interview. Yep. So you look at like, we did the Ryan Trahan interview, we did the Tommy Innan interview, and then three in a row, back to back to back, we do Mr. Beast Manager Reed, Cody and Noel, and Rhett and Link. And those are all long form interviews and right there, CPM increases. And I think that's also about giving YouTube a better idea of who you are, what right. you stand for, what type of content you make so that they know you're reliable. Yeah, totally. You I, know, if you yeah. think about yourself as a, a restaurant, mm -hmm. you need to be open a certain amount of hours, the mm -hmm. same time every week, you need to serve the same type of food at the same quality. Right. And then customers yeah. start coming. I, and, I like to think about when you're making a YouTube channel, think about um, making like a Yelp page for the channel. And be like, you really want to bring up Yelp right now? Yeah, I mean, it was with, my, you, with your history, it was my past life. I was a Yelp fluencer for a while. Yeah, but I abandoned that. Don't look it up. Do not look up my Yelp. Ruthless. Videos. Don't look it up. Samir was ruthless. But I think about making a Yelp page where it's like, okay, here's the type of cuisine I have. Here's the hours I'm open. And here's the menu, right? And all of that is, is on a Yelp page. And the worst thing is if someone looks and they're like, oh, cool, they're open at 10 o'clock and they serve coffee and avocado toast. And then they show up at 10 o'clock, it's not open and they're serving noodles and pastries and no, like, and you're just like, wait, what? You said, this is what you served from this time to this time. And I showed up and it just wasn't correct. Sounds like you're still harboring some pain from this experience. Whenever that happens, it's <laughs> terrible, right? Yeah. That and happened then, to me. And then if, if it's you, you well, Yelp them. You know what? In Europe, not a big Yelp culture. People don't update their Yelps. So you look up a restaurant when I'm in Copenhagen, we'll go over there. Hey, let me go check it out. Not open. What's the deal? So bring that to YouTube yeah. and think about yourself as, you know, a restaurant that needs to communicate to customers. When are you open? What type of food do you make? What's your menu? What, what do you offer here? Like just add, a, just think about that conceptually. And I really think that that adds to becoming a better partner to YouTube because then YouTube can trust you. Like, oh, cool. This guy uploads every Monday and makes content about this. And these are the type of people that come here. And now I know. Now when I go, when advertisers come in, I can be really clear that if you advertise on this channel, that's the type of user you're getting to. Trust. At the end of the day, it's all trust. It's all about it's all about trust. trust. Like. Sure, your product is video. Sure, your product, whatever your product is, at the end of the day, you're selling trust. Be the most trustworthy channel. So let's talk about, again, just back to our philosophy on the $268,000 and AdSense, you know, as a whole. This is an incredible um, style of making money uh, at, for a creator. Like to make money where, like we mentioned, you're not, you know, picking up the phone, pitching your content. You're not uh, sending a deck. You're not signing, an, you know, an agreement with each single, every advertiser. Um, the way we did, the way we look at this is, is what I call found money. And it's what a lot of people call found money. It's essentially like, it's not planned for, it's not projected and we don't have control over it. So I refer to this as found money. So when I look at like our projections for this year, the found money category is not even in there because it's literally found. It's not like projected for, it's not controlled. Mm -hmm. It's not part of our goal setting. You know, I, I don't want to base how we operate, how we pay our expenses, how we pay our employees on YouTube AdSense. Because the reality is, even if we made the exact same number of videos in the same category, in a similar style, 
it's not guaranteed that we would do the same amount of money, more mm-hmm. amount of money. We really have no idea in terms of where the ad market's going to go, how yeah. competitive our category will be, what's going to happen on YouTube. We really don't. Yeah, we have no idea. Yeah. And the, we probably will put out less videos and experiment a little bit more on the main channel this year right. than we did last year. Right. So we can't pin any of our overhead mm-hmm. against that number. No. So what we do is we pin our overhead and our expenses and our projections to brand partnerships, which is what we can control. We can pick up the phone, build a relationship with a brand. We have long lasting relationships with brand and we can tell them what we're working on. We can book deals with them. That gives us the foundation to understand how we're going to operate as a business. Again, by the end of the year, we find out how much we made on AdSense and we're like, cool, great. And month to month, we kind of look at that. And I know some creators look at it as their production budget. So some creators look at it like whatever I made in AdSense, that's how much I can spend on my videos. And we looked at that also when we came to building this set that we're sitting on right now. This set was largely built by um, the ad AdSense revenue in November, mm-hmm. which was our biggest month um, ever in AdSense. So November of 2020, um, 2022, we made $49,682. That's 20% basically, of how much we made. And that's largely because of the Mr. Beast Burger documentary. Right. And what happens is when you have a big piece like that, that, that doc did, you know, three, four million views in the first few weeks. What happens when you have a moment like that on your channel is it lifts the library so long as your library is related to that mm-hmm. and people can get interested. And I think that's, it's so, so important to, to just keep coming back to that concept of like catalog value and being like, when I have a hit, what happens is my entire library picks up if it's relevant. So that's the value of like a viral video. Once you've developed a catalog, it just lifts everything up. For me, it really, again, just makes me look at the videos that we're going to make this year and want to ensure that they are a standard of quality that I'm happy with and proud of yeah. forever. That I'm, I'm happy with the amount of effort I put in. Yeah. Tried my hardest to make it a great experience mm-hmm. for people because- it may not be the video that hits, but there will be some that do hit that yeah. probably send people to some of these other videos and they will be watched for all of time. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you look at our interview with Mr. Beast, it saw some of the vast majority of its viewership a year later, like a year after. It has over 15 million views now, but in the first three months, it had like 3 million views. It also was our highest earning video of last year. And it wasn't posted last year. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's super interesting, right? That a video that wasn't posted last year made us, I think 60 or $70,000. So we'll, oh, 60 or 70,000. Yeah. So it's crazy. That's like almost half. I mean, what are we talking about? Here? It's crazy. What are we talking it's, it's about? It's unbelievable. We didn't publish also, thanks, that Jimmy. video. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. We didn't publish that video last year, but that's like the catalog value is so incredibly, you know, present. Think about creators who you know, have these crazy evergreen catalogs, videos that can be watched for long periods of time. I mean, think about Mr. Beast, Jimmy, right? Like on Lex Friedman, he was just talking about how he thinks one of the videos he's made recently over time will get to a billion views. And it's like, yeah, that actually cognitively like totally makes sense. Of course it will. His videos hit like two, three hundred million. Of course, over the next couple of years, they'll, they'll hit that. But that means they're going to like 3x over the next few years, yeah, you know, like that's, that's what's crazy is this appreciating asset that you have in video. I don't know anywhere else where you can do that. No, no. Yeah. So there, there's a creator named Jordan Welsh who made a video asking a bunch of different YouTubers, like what was their biggest month on AdSense? And there's some numbers that are really crazy, right? Personal finance creator, Charlie Chang with 700,000 subscribers, his biggest month, $245,000. Essentially what we did last year. Yeah, in a in month. A, in a month, yeah. Quebble Cop, yep. 15 million subscribers. He's a streamer. $1 million in a month. Jordan Welsh, 800,000 subscribers. In July last year, $61,000 covering entrepreneurship. And Arax featured in this video as well at $480,000 in a month with 10 million subscribers. Like this is substantial amounts of money. What's even crazier is this is after the YouTube split. Like to think about how much money is spent on YouTube from an advertising perspective, it's unbelievable. 
Yeah, and it's it's such a far cry from what we thought. Like yeah. when we first started out <laughs> mm-hmm. on YouTube, right? Like our understanding with the first company and channel, the Lacrosse Network, quickly was that AdSense will play a huge role. Well, it was your <clears throat> thought that it would play a huge role. Yeah. And then very quickly, well, the could, understanding when you got your first check. Yeah. It was like, oh, of course could, this won't be a big conceptually, role for us. Conceptually, I was, I was, you know, I learned the idea of YouTube in 2010, which was you upload videos to this site and the site pays you. And that's also a thing that we talked about last week. Um, but it's the base premise of search, right? Like we are providing really good search results to YouTube as publishers of content. People search stuff. And if they find our search results valuable, they click on it, they go through it, and then YouTube rewards us for providing that content as publishers. Like that's the base premise. That premise was really interesting to me because I didn't have to ask anyone, Mm -hmm. but I was hit very hard immediately when the first AdSense check came and it was like, you know, a hundred bucks or something, or the first AdSense earnings report came and it was like 38 cents. And I was like, oh my God, you have to do so many views, you know, for this to work. And also the ad market wasn't there in 2010. And even then it was okay though, because we were in a niche yeah. where there wasn't that much competition Yeah, and we were able to eventually attract brand partners yep. and, and build that into a real business uh, that generated solid revenue, mm-hmm. even though AdSense was never a part right. of the picture. I think that was a big benefit to us. Um, I want to answer this question from Nick and then we'll get back to that. Do top creators manually time their mid-roll ad breaks? Is it worth spending the time to create natural breaks in your content for mid-roll ads? Um, okay, so a lot of top creators do manually put in mid-roll ad breaks. Um, and the thing that you have to realize, again, back to what I was saying, is YouTube is going to optimize for viewer satisfaction. So it's not in YouTube's best interest for a user to get ad, 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 ad. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put the manual breaks in, there is a possibility that that happens. And I would say as a creator, you should also be thinking about viewer satisfaction. So one thing that I started to do is in our long form interviews, in the beginning, I actually look at the automatic ad placements. And typically YouTube in in a 45 minute or hour long video will put four ad breaks. Uh, One as a pre-roll you know, and then essentially uh, three more in the video. And I think that's reasonable for an hour. Like Mm -hmm. it's an hour of content. I think it's okay to have three ad breaks. Typically do the automatic ones. Um, That's how I used to do it. It feels pretty comparable. Honestly, even a better experience than watching Hulu. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. But Hulu is not a great experience. I know. Yeah. But the reality is when you're watching on maybe a connected TV, YouTube creators, top YouTube creators are competing against some of these streaming platforms and yeah. some of them which are ad supported. True. So if you look at the ad experience, Hulu is a worse ad experience. Yeah. More often the ads are less relevant. Yep. So they actually do a pretty good job, I think, and make it pretty reasonable. So what I started to do was actually look at like, for example, our Ludwig interview that has crossed over 800,000, close to a million views. And I went back in and I was like, there's only about four ad slots. Let's see what happens if I add more ad slots. And I added more ad slots and I tracked the comments. No one changed their perspective. Because again, like the whole thing's going to be built for viewer satisfaction. And I think a lot of audience members are okay with mid-roll advertising. And again, it's not going to serve you back-to-back mid-rolls based on your session on YouTube. So that's a huge part of the fluctuation, but I would always optimize for viewer experience and just know that YouTube's also optimizing for that. Okay, here's another question. This one is from Philip Dizen. Mm Mm-hmm. And it reads, why are CPMs low in certain countries, regardless of content inventory and what can be made better to increase them? So that's another part of the reason why CPMs can fluctuate. Yep. Um, you know, the, the cost of buying advertising in the United States is higher than, let's say, parts of India. Yep. Even though you can find lots of viewership in India, mm-hmm. there is less of a buying potential. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that will. Well, there's just also like, um, yeah, there's just different ad markets. Yeah. Like based on where the viewers are. So advertisers are tracking the viewers. If they have like, if they have a U.S. focused product too, like it's going to be advertised in the U.S. And also, like you said, buying power matters a lot. And that, that depends on rates that willing people are willing to pay for certain types of audiences. So it's, it absolutely fluctuates based on country. And, um, next week we're going to be talking about YouTube shorts. Mm Mm-hmm. That is like the, the creator, the pools of revenue are actually split up by country there. So it's going to become more prevalent. Like 
how much money you're making, you know, and, and how those pools of revenue are different for each country. Mm -hmm. All right. This one comes from Mohammed, who submitted through our uh, submission form on the published press, which is linked in our description. Uh, if you want to ask us a question through that, hey, Colin and Samir, how do creators in the community manage their finances, especially when it comes to taxes? I remember watching the Graham Stephan episode on the Samir and Colin channel and was shocked that he was using Mint while making five million plus dollars. We're building a new product. Not sure what you see on our site right now to help creators manage their finances. However, it's interesting to see how few creators actually make money and those who do aren't the best at keeping track of their ins and outs. Is there something you've experienced before too, Muhammad? So we, we give this advice quite a bit, but like the first dollars that we ever spent as Colin and Samir were for an accountant. Mm -hmm. And we probably didn't even have enough revenue to, to do that, but we had some revenue coming in from, you know, creative projects. And that was for me like a, a very valid expense. And I think for a lot of creators and creatives, one, one thing that's really important is to make sure your mental space is clear enough to be creative. Mm -hmm. And dealing with money can take a lot of time and add a lot of stress and kind of reduce your creativity. So I would say number one, it's like an accountant is a really good <laughs> first step. And there's a lot of creative accountants for freelancers or you know, creators that you can, you can look up and maybe we'll link some uh, in our description. But beyond that, it's like QuickBooks is a fantastic tool. I would just use that, you know, like Mint, I think is interesting for budgeting. But the first thing I ever did was a Google spreadsheet that just wrote down, like, what do we spend every single month? And that for me was outs. What goes out of this bank account every month? What's for sure going to go out? And then what are some projections on what could go out? So what's my rent? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, uh, what's our equipment cost or our software cost? How much do we pay for editing software? What's our cost of, uh, you know, freelance help? You know, say, do we have an editor that we work with? Um, and if, you, if you're not like a company, if you're a solo creator, literally put this in for like, how much rent do I pay to live where I live? Um, what do I pay on f for food every month? Just like write that down. Yeah, that, that was really helpful for us, especially in the early stages when our channel was not making enough money for both of us to be full time. Yeah, we made $4,000 uh, in, in, in 2019. Remember that? And we started this channel in from, 2016. From the YouTube Partner Program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. And even from a brand deal perspective, I remember, you know, we were doing deals around 1500 3000 in early stages. Mm -hmm. This might have been like 2018. But I remember talking with you about it and you telling me, okay, if that's our rate, yeah, we need to do at least four of these a month. <laughs> yeah. And that seemed so difficult because we weren't even getting the inbound. Yep. Right. We weren't getting, we were getting gifting deals at the time yeah. where people were like, yeah, you can just talk about our product, totally. but we're not going to pay you for it. And that really helped us at least make a decision of, okay, YouTube's not going to be where we make most of our revenue. Yeah, we, we, need can, to, we, we need to be freelance production. We need to start a production company essentially or just find other ways to yeah. supplement because we're not ready by any means to go full-time. Yeah, totally. So that, and that's what we recognize with our outs. And then you can, you know, on the other side of that spreadsheet, write what's coming in. If nothing's coming in, then you're going to develop like how much do you need to come in? So let's say your, your monthly expenses are $4,000. Essentially, you know, with tax and everything, you're going to need like 10 grand to come in if you live in California, um, you know, a month, let's say six grand or something like if you live somewhere else. So that, that gives you some, some clarity on your finances. But again, an accountant's really helpful to just like keep track of everything you're spending. When you're a YouTube creator or a creative of any type, you're like spending on all kinds of stuff that's added into your creativity, right? If you need props, if you need to go on a trip, if you, whatever you need to do, and you kind of just want someone to, to handle that. And I think it's a really valid expense for, for managing your finances. So you're saying I can write, write off this jumpsuit. Yeah. This is a write off. Yeah. Not financial advice, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I think you can. I'll take it. Um, all right. I think the, the important thing that I want to talk about too, when it comes to AdSense and like the general business of being a creator, I think that a lot of young creators right now are looking at AdSense as like the way to make money on YouTube. And it is a massive way because we talked about some of those big, big numbers, but that suggests that you need to build a, a mass appeal audience. And I don't want to discount the concept that you can have an audience of, you know, 10, 20,000 people and still monetize. The, the, the thing that 
that you need to do is hyper target that audience and be really clear about your value prop. And that will lead you to figuring out who are the brands that are trying to do the same thing? Who are the brands that are speaking to the same people? That's more work to pitch a brand, to get on the phone or have, mm -hmm. have a manager or an agent who's then taking a commission. Like there's more complexities when you get into the world of brand deals. It also could change your process for making videos because totally. now you're making an ad integration. Yeah, which has to be a certain type of way. It has to be in the video. Yeah, exactly. But I think if you're not a creator who's like gonna look at like evergreen content that has mass appeal and high virality, then you might not be able to make money from AdSense. You know, it might not be significant. And I think it was the biggest gift for us that it wasn't significant for so many years. We, we today, even if this uh, three or four X is by next year, I'll still treat it like found money. I will not, our process is not such that anymore that we look at it and go like, that's a, that's a line item in our business. It's more of like, here's found money. Now with this, let's, let's enhance what we're doing. Yeah, you know, let's, let's use it let's, to grow. Let's use it to invest in the studio. Let's use it to invest in our office. Let's use it to mm -hmm. invest in places, but I won't ever look at it and be like, that will cover our expense next month. Totally. I just will never look at it like that. And I would, I think it's a good strategy for a lot of creators to look at it too. Um, now, obviously if you're making a ton and you don't have a lot of expenses, it's okay. Cause then you can kind of be relaxed and create on your own pace. But just as you're growing a business, I think it's a really helpful tool. Um, and to really understand like, am I, an, am I an AdSense creator or am I a brand deal creator or am I a hybrid of these two? You know, it's gonna, it, it, there are some creators who just make so much. If you're making 400 grand on, on AdSense in a month, don't listen to what I'm saying. You know, <laughs> that's fine. You're going to be fine unless you have some crazy amount of expenses. Who knows what type of channel yeah, they who, have. Who yeah. knows what type of channel they have where they have to spend a lot for videos. One thing I thought was really cool was Levi Allen, who's a creator, put out a thread on Twitter, which was about the largest paycheck he's gotten from YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it was during the 12th month of his 11th year, despite having lower average views, lower average views on uploads last year. That means every video I uploaded last year performed worst than the year past, but I still made money from my back catalog. Yeah, he said he averaged ten to 12,000 yeah. views a video this last year, but he made enough money mm -hmm. uh, in that last month where, you know, it's still contributing to his bills. Like, it's still mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. And that's where it is, this found money, exactly as yeah. you're saying. Like, right. that is just, you can't rely on that. Mm -hmm. But man, what a gift for Levi Allen that this work he's put in over the years, making phenomenal videos is still paying off. Yeah. Even if he has you know, as he says, like a down year. I think this concept is also why YouTube will right now be the, probably the only place where you can build a substantial career in the creator space because there's no other platform that's like that. There's no other platform that's paying you for your, your catalog, right? No, no, I don't. No, just doesn't don't exist. So. Not to say you can't build a substantial career on yeah, obviously of course, of course, Instagram, but it's, I'm, I'm saying in this way where there's like, this passive is a revenue. This is the closest sort of thing way. to passive income that we have right now. Like again, you said we didn't upload and we're still receiving a check. Yeah. It's the closest thing to passive income we have here, which is which is really crazy. It means that we're building like appreciating assets in our library. Mm -hmm. It's it's somewhat similar to what's happening in music, where people are selling the rights to their catalog mm -hmm. uh, and other people are then able to make money off that catalog and they get a big lump sum. It's not exactly can, the same. Can I share a thought? Is it a thought or a gripe? It's, it's a bit of a gripe, but it's a bit of a thought, and I've been scared to say it. Okay. You brought up music. I want to talk about Taylor Swift. Okay. What are you about to say, man? Is she that good? What? Here? Yeah. Now? I'm just, I just want to just offer it as like- You think this is the place? I just want to offer it. To because potentially go after I'm, not just no, Taylor no, no, Swift, no, no, but no. Taylor Swift fans. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is she whoa, whoa, whoa. that good? I just want to offer it and just, just throw it out there and say, Taylor Swift- Who do sold, you think you are? Sold out her you know, tour like in an instant. And I went, I was like, let me, let me give her latest album a listen. And I was like, Yeah. It's good, but is it, is she like a revolutionary artist? Am I like digging myself a deep hole? Yeah, right I, now? I don't okay, see the you're upside. Not you're not, I don't, I'm, I'm bowing out of this You're one. bowing out of this conversation. Yeah. So I'm alone having this conversation. Yeah. I, I see I, no also, upside to I'm this conversation. I'm not saying any definitives. I'm just throwing up. No, I think you're, well, you're, you're throwing it up, but you're leaning one way with it. Throwing up a topic. 
Okay, well, I'll move on from that topic because clearly that's not that's not a conversation I mean, we're I about to have. I just think that's a divisive. That's just not yeah. a conversation we're about to have. That's like saying like BTS, any good? Didn't say that. But it's like it. Talked about T-Swift. A lot of fans there. Okay. A lot of angry ones. So now to music, because you brought that up. That yep. was you. You brought that upon <laughs> okay, us. Okay, but go ahead. That's all you. Um, music is so interesting to me because you as like a creative, you spend all this time developing this piece and you make this three minute piece and it can be listened to forever. It's just like this timeless piece of creative work. You know, like how many times have you listened to your favorite song? Thousands. Thousands of times. How many times have you watched your favorite movie? 30. You've watched your favorite movie 30 times. What's your favorite movie? It's just a guess and it's hypothetical. What's your favorite movie? First movie that comes to mind is Almost Famous. Oh, wow. One of my favorite You've watched that 30 times? Yeah, okay, fine. 15? Yeah, maybe even less. Maybe 10. Okay, wait. Now really think hard about this one. Eight? I could see that as a very real possibility. Maybe eight. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe eight. Maybe eight. Eight would be like- More than eight. It's my favorite movie. If you watched a movie eight times, you'd be like, that's insane how many times I've watched that movie, right? You watch a YouTube video, like I've probably watched a few YouTube videos like four times. I'm not going to watch a YouTube video a hundred times. That's true. So actually our concept as creators, rather than music, how music works, because music catalogs are extremely valuable because one person can listen to the same song over and over and over and over again, thousands of times. But when it comes to YouTube, we're actually betting on the ever expanding nature of the platform. We're betting on the fact that new users will come to YouTube to watch our stuff. Not that the same user will watch it over and over and over again. It's a completely different type of catalog value. And I think that's like, it's a really interesting thing because, you know, when we talked to Jimmy, um, he was saying that like YouTube is now, you know, it's installed on every Android device. You start to look at like, how mu- how many people are going to have access to YouTube in the coming years? It kind of is this ever expanding group, mm-hmm. but it still suggests that we're making content right now for completely new viewers in years to come. And I am wondering, you know, who's going to make or who is anyone going to figure out, you know, YouTube videos that can be viewed by the same person? And I guess maybe that's fitness. Yeah fitness creators probably have really long-term catalogs where like yoga with Adrian or blog where you can watch this fitness routine technically every day for a year if you love it, right? If you love this yoga sequence, you can watch it every day. I think it's really interesting for creators to think about like the difference between that. Am I developing a piece of content that's going to be evergreen because brand new people are going to continue to search it and watch it? Or am I developing a piece of content that the same group of people can fall in love with and watch every day? What I wonder is the people that will watch YouTube in the future, do they want to watch long form video? Is shorts yeah. and short form content a bet on future audiences that totally. perhaps they're not as interested in long form video? Yeah. That they would rather, if they're going to watch a long form video, it's been curated by a streamer. Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe. All right. This is from Wasatch Pop. Not a question, but I wish YouTube AdSense was better in January. So that is an interesting thing that because of the holidays and people Mm -hmm. having budget at the end of the year, (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's a really good time in November and December uh, for payments from YouTube because there's just a lot of money from advertisers flowing in. And then at the beginning of the year, there's not. Right. People aren't really spending in January. Yeah. Uh, This. Can we talk about something? Yeah. We talked about this in the published press. It okay. was the top blurb. Okay. But the fact that Logan and KSI's Prime Holy is going sh- to have a Super Bowl commercial. Insane. And the going rate, from what I read, is $7 million. It's insane. They, they, it's, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, just to talk about I don't advertising. Even know, I don't even know how to wrap my head around how successful Prime has been. Like, I really don't. For me, the and maybe it's, you know, obviously we're in LA, which is a very creator-friendly market, but I... I was at a Walmart, I was at a vitamin shop, and in both stores, there was literally like one or two bottles left. Like you could see where Prime was supposed to be. And I don't know if that's a stocking issue, but from what it's, like the proof to me seems like in the physical spaces. I was talking to someone um, 
this week who is telling me that like at their kid's school, there's a huge reselling market for it. Yeah. Like kids will, will buy it and resell it. And there's also this culture right now where kids who have prime bottles will drink the prime and then refill it with water because they like the vibe of having a prime bottle. That's crazy. Like that's a wild brand that they've built in one year. I, I think it's like, and, and I think what would be interesting is creators who are building brands like Feastables, Chamberlain Coffee, Prime, why are they not running huge YouTube campaigns? Like if they can run a Super Bowl ad, why are they not running YouTube pre-roll? Yeah, I agree that that's right? a huge missed opportunity. Or there's some reason that we don't know, but like how is Jimmy not running Feastables ads all over his library, all over Ludwig's library, my, our library, Arax library? Like I how mean, are they why not aren't we running published press ads on YouTube as YouTube pre-roll? All right, that's a good way to turn that on ourselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. I feel like people don't know how. Like Facebook advertising is much easier. Like obviously you can talk to an ad agency who will do it for you, but yeah, it's a good question. I think I think creators should run ads on YouTube. I think creators it would be fascinating like even for this channel, what if we ran YouTube ads for creator support across YouTube? Why don't we do that as an experiment? We should do that as an experiment. That's good. And then talk about how it worked, like how it converted and how much we spent. That's a good idea. There we I go. like that. That's good. Are we in the deep end? Right, right now we're in the deep end. Okay, sure. I wasn't sure yeah, yeah, because- no, 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 We're in the deep end my, right now. My toes aren't touching the bottom. Right. <laughs> and I've been treading water. If you're here with us and you're on YouTube, put a snorkel emoji in the comments to let us know that you made it here to the deep end. And if you're listening, you know, send us a tweet. Let us know you're in the you, deep end. You got a gripe? No, I, I don't have a gripe this time. You're just totally gripeless. Gripeless yeah. right now. You have a gripe? Yeah, probably. I got all I mean, kinds I'm of sure gripes. I have a gripe, but I just nothing comes to mind. Mm. You gotta have something. Yeah, I mean I have all kinds of gripes. Okay. Apparently not. Is there a shortage of gripes? I haven't checked the news, but are we out? Oh, I got a gripe. Okay. Yeah, I got a gripe. I think um This is a this is a legacy gripe that I think a lot of people have. Love a good legacy it's a, gripe. It's just a legacy gripe. Like people just this is one that just is one of the questions of the universe of like how do you solve this? It's when you get into your car and something you don't want to be listening to in that moment just pops through your bluetooth and just blares through. And this has happened to me since I've been an audiobook consumer that I'll get into my car I'm just relaxed, turn the car on, start driving. Chapter of an audiobook just starts going mid chapter. And I'm like, flustered. Mm. What do I do? Oh yeah. my God. Why did they just, just start playing? Like, what is the story with the Bluetooth auto connect? Like, just, I'm going to make the decision if I want to play it, Bluetooth. Don't just automatically start playing. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I'm listening to a podcast and I, I, I really welcome the fact that it just continues without me having But you didn't to. make the choice. It just starts playing. You don't know where you are in it. You didn't mentally prepare to start listening. It's just starting to play. Thanks for uh, yeah, listening okay. and watching right. and, and viewing this episode of Creator Support. This is a brand new world for us to be here on YouTube. It's a brand new world for everything. <laughs> it's, a brand, it's just... <laughs> It's just a brand Look, new it's world. a brand new world. It's a brand new uh, world. It's a new year. It's a new us. We have a new studio. So if you're listening and you've been a listener and you're in the deep end, thank you so much. And just to let you know, you have the option now to go watch, comment, interact with us on YouTube. If you're here on YouTube, you also have the option to go listen on Spotify or Apple Pods or wherever you listen to podcasts. So we'll be making this show throughout the year, and we really want to make this show as interactive as possible. We want to make sure we're answering your questions, your topics. So if you have something in mind that you want us to cover, you can let us know on Twitter. You can let us know on our subreddit. You can let us know here in the comments. But we'll be here to support you guys, creators, for the whole year. Creator support. And maybe every once in a while, we'll have people come on the show. Yeah. And support you and I and support everyone who watches and Absolutely. listens, which is going to be yeah. exactly what happens next week. Next week. We're joined by two employees from YouTube to talk about shorts. We'll see you there.